folks who are still up want to take a seat. Um, I'm guessing you guys can hear me okay, right? I'm generally pretty loud. Okay, perfect. <laughs> so that should not be a problem. Uh, well, thank you guys for being here for this. It's a wonderful program the Press Club has put together. I'm glad to be a part of it. Um, my name is Sarah. I'm a reporter at the New York Times as of a few months ago. Before that, um, I was a writer for the website Vox, and generally I've been covering healthcare in some form or another for about a decade at this point. Um, and if you are curious what happened to my foot, as it is very obvious, is I broke it three weeks ago, um, chasing a dog who got out of the house. Um, the dog is, is fine and at home, and uh, my foot is not. So, um, so if you ever want to do real world reporting on the healthcare system, that is certainly one way to accomplish it. Um, so I am here to talk a little bit about bringing people into your policy stories. This is something I've really been doing more over the past few years. I started off as like a very straight policy reporter and have gotten more into telling narratives as a way to tell policy stories, um, mostly because I think it enhances your journalism, it enhances your understanding of it. So I'm going to talk about kind of why it's important to me, how you can do it, and some of the techniques you might want to use. Um, I want to encourage you guys, I've heard you're a relatively um, active and engaged group, which is wonderful. Um, so if you would like to ask questions along the way, don't feel the, the need to wait till the end. Just raise your hand. Um, somebody, not me, will bring a microphone to you. Um, and I've been told to ask that you, um, you wait till the microphone is there to ask your question since they're recording this. Um, and, um, but before we start, just to get a sense of who's in the room, I was wondering just by a show of hands, like how many of you guys consider yourselves policy report, like full-time policy reporters? Okay. Um, and the rest, like how many, just like more of a general assignment, like interested in getting more into policy reporting? Okay. Um, and then anyone who didn't raise their hands, just can a few people like tell me what kind of work you do, kind of what interested you? Yeah. Okay. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. Okay. Um, here we go. Hi, I'm Rebecca Gabriella Carmel, the Democratic graduate at NYU, and I'm working in the Joint Committee on Policy and Judicial Programs. Mm -hmm. and cool. We'll do one more, and then I'll probably get to it. Um, you are a very engaged group. I like that. <laughs> yeah. Documentary filmmaker. Okay. Okay. Awesome. We'll definitely talk about that. Okay. Um, so we're going to start by talking about vegetables. Um, and the reason I want to talk about that is it's something you know I learned from my old editor in chief at Vox, Ezra Klein, who um, I really agree with and kind of has shaped how I think about policy journalism. So I think there can be a view, especially in like a kind of daily general newspaper sense, that policies are almost like the vegetables of coverage, right? Like they're the thing you should read, but it's kind of boring. And like the dessert is really like the politics and the horse race and like the interesting kind of uh, stuff. And then the policy is kind of somewhere in the back, and you feel like. I should read it, or even in our stories, right, that the policy is kind of lower down. It's a thing you should read, but it's more dutiful. But the thing about vegetables is, like, they can be really boring and not very delicious, like those, um, you know, those steamed carrots and broccoli on the left, or they can be really delicious. Like, if you go to Zetania, they make wonderful Brussels sprouts, and, and they are so good because they're very good at cooking them. And Ezra has this wonderful, I, I'm stealing this analogy from him, that Policy journalism is the same. You know, we can decide that it is boring and we can write it dutifully and our readers are going to find it boring and not be very excited by it. Or we can, you know, make it exciting and kind of say, you know, it can be just as interesting as politics coverage and people can want to read these stories. And I think one of the ways you get people to want to read policy stories is by bringing people into them. So it's no longer just numbers and figures, but these are real narratives that tell us something about what's going on in the country. So this is kind of an example of two ways you can cook a similar story. They're both mine, because if I was going to talk about a bad headline, I wanted it to be one that I wrote. Um, and I will say, I wrote this headline. I'm not going to blame any editors for it. Um, 
So the top headline is from when I worked at the Washington Post on a blog called Wonk Blog, where we wrote our own headlines. And this was a story about how the fact that healthcare costs are growing slowly, but because of rising deductibles, patients aren't really noticing it. So you know, the headline was healthcare costs are growing slowly. Americans haven't noticed. It's just not a very interesting story. I will say that as the author of it. There, there's not really much that makes you think, hmm, I'd love to like learn more about a thing that Americans are not noticing. It doesn't really draw you in. Um, you know, compare that to another headline I wrote that essentially, you know, these are about the same story, that healthcare costs are expensive and everyone is feeling them. Um, so the second one, which I wrote, uh, you know, I guess three years later at Vox, is um, the case of the $629 Band-Aid and what it reveals about American healthcare. Um, I will say that was one of my most read stories in the five years I was at Vox. It brought a lot of people in because they saw in the headline, like, oh my gosh, like $629 Band-Aid? That's wild. And even though there are lots of stories out there about costs in the American system, I wasn't discovering necessarily anything super new by you know, writing about the fact that healthcare is expensive, it brought a lot more attention to the issue by having a really compelling personal example to bring people in. Um, so I think that really shows you kind of the, the what a personal narrative can bring to your reporting. Um, so today we're going to go through three things. You know, the first, why there's value in bringing people into your policy coverage. The second is when it makes sense and when it doesn't, because I think there are some stories where for a number of reasons, it just doesn't make sense to bring in personal narratives. I'll talk a little bit of how I make those decisions every day when I'm doing my job. And the third is, you know, I always find the hardest thing for this is, okay, how do I find these people? I want to bring them in. What do I do to get them? So I'm going to talk about some of the things that I've done. I'd also love to hear if there's people have experimented with other ways. I'm constantly looking for new ways to find the most interesting stories. So, you know, if, if you guys have things to share from the reporting you've done on that and other things, we'd love to hear about them. Um, so, you know, why there's value in bringing people into your policy coverage? I kind of see four main reasons. Um, the first is that they draw readers in. They just make your stories a lot more interesting when you can show that policy is consequence. Um, I love, I've been a policy journalist basically my entire reporting career. And the reason I love it, like I do, I do enjoy like decoding nerdy documents and like I really enjoyed reading all the, uh, this tells you about what kind of person I am, like reading all the Republican repeal plans and understanding how they were similar and different. Um, I find it interesting to digest that. But the reason I really like it is because all this stuff matters. Everything that is happening, it, it has real world impact and consequences. And that's the thing I love about being a policy journalist is being able to sh not just decode the documents, but show, okay, what does this mean for people? Um, and that's the second reason I think it's important to bring people in, is they really show the consequences of what's happening here in state houses, in regulation, um, in so many, in a corporate policy, for example, is another type of policy journalism you could do. They show the consequences of when someone in power writes the rules differently, what does that mean for the people who have less power? Um, they help you, when you bring people in, you discover policies you didn't even know about. People are interacting with all these crazy policy things that are happening, and sometimes you only find out when someone's been affected by it firsthand. And last, they change the way you think about policy. I think sometimes there can, when you're talking to a lot of policy experts, they can say, oh, you know, it works X, Y, and Z ways, or it's having this effect. Then you actually talk to the people who are being affected by it, and you find out it's a totally different story on the ground. Um, so I want to give you some examples of stories, um, some stories I've worked on, some stories I've really admired that kind of show how this works. Um, so a first example is drawing readers in. Um, you know, using personal narratives, it really brings readers to sto stories, encourages people to share their stories. Um, this is a wonderful story that ProPublica ran, I guess, three years ago at this point about the rising maternal mortality rate. And I think this is a really great example of this is data that a lot of people knew about and have been writing about for years. We had known for years that the maternal mortality rate was rising in the United States. And what ProPublica did, which was very smart, is you know the data they were writing about wasn't new, but they started looking for examples of, OK, what does this look like in the real world? And they found the story of a woman who was a neonatal nurse, someone who you really wouldn't expect to die in childbirth, and told the story of how she actually ended up dying in the process of having her baby. Um, it was such an impactful story, and it brought some data that had already been out there, already been public. Um, it brought it out in new ways. Um, and the thing it did, you know, running a story like this, and I think what's so smart about the way ProPublica does their reporting, is it, brought, it encouraged other people to read their stories. So this was the beginning of a series that ProPublica did 
where they had this little call out that I put on the screen where it said, you know, we're investigating this and we need your help. So if you know someone who's been through this, if you're a nurse or a doctor who works in this area, they encouraged people to reach out. So I think one of the things I've seen in my policy reporting is when people see someone who looks similar to them in your, their stories, they might think to reach out to you and say, oh, maybe that reporter is interested in my story as well. Um, it can also be one of the frustrating things of reporting that you put your story out there and then four people reach out to you and you're like, where were you guys when I was reporting this story in the first place? But luckily, you can hopefully you can convince your editors that these are still stories worth reporting on. The great thing about the internet that most of us work on is there's no limit on the pages or there's no inch limit. So I think the more news out there, the better. So that's an example of drawing readers in. Um, another one was this um, story from a former New York Times reporter, Libby Rosenthal, who's now the editor-in-chief of Kaiser Health News. She did this wonderful series in 2013 called Paying Till It's Hearts. And basically the premise of the, the, the series was trying to show the high cost of American healthcare. Again, this wasn't necessarily new, but it was putting a brand new face on it. And there was this one story in particular about a man who got a $117,000 bill um, surprise bill after surgery. This was from someone who had been involved in his care and but had not been the main doctor. He had gone to an in-network surgeon, ended up with an out-of-network bill. It's something we've become more familiar with as Congress is debating surprise medical billing. Um, but again, this was something where there was a common problem and it put a really compelling face on it and told the story really well. Um, and I think one thing I like about stories like these is they, you know, I'm an investigative reporter at the Times, but my real strengths, they aren't in like finding secret documents. That's not one of my um, top strengths. I'm not a great data wrangler. But ben is going to talk to you more about how to do that. Um, what I really like doing is looking at you know, things that we know about, but how are they affecting people? And I think it gives reporters, you know, if you're not digging for those secret documents, like these are the type of things that are just out in the open kind of waiting to be found. And I think kind of an untapped resource for us reporters. Um, so another example, using people to find policy and to change policy. Um, so this is a story that I'm really proud of um, that I worked on at Vox, where I was, um, I did a lot, the last large project I did was collecting emergency room bills for patients. So this was a purely, you know, people-powered reporting project where we decided that the cost of emergency rooms were really high, really variable, but also really unknown. And the only way we were going to find that out, because hospitals keep prices secret, is to ask patients to submit their bills. Um, and I was really shocked how many people were willing to do that. I, you know, at first going into this, we had no experience and almost thought, like, well, who's going to send a random reporter their medical bill? Well, it turns out 2,000 people were willing to send random reporters their medical bills because they were so frustrated with the billing experience they had. And one of the things I kept seeing, um, you know, I was the only person reading the bills. So, you know, every day I'd spend an hour or so just kind of reading through whatever had come in. I started to see this pattern at a particular hospital, Zuckerberg, San Francisco General, where all these people were having these like crazy high bills. And when I say all these people, it's maybe like a half dozen or so. You know, the first two or three times I saw it, I thought, oh, that's probably something weird with their insurance. But then when I started seeing it more and more, I'm like, there is like some kind of pattern going on here. And what I was able to figure out through those interviews is that this hospital was out of network with all the patients I was talking to. Um, it's pretty common for emergency rooms to have some out of network doctors. It's very, very rare for the emergency room itself to be out of network. In this case, San Francisco General is the only trauma center in the area. So if you have a trauma, the ambulance or the helicopter, they are going to take you to San Francisco General. Um, so in, in that case, you know, this is one case of having enough people becomes a data set. And a data set can help you find new policies. I was able to discover by talking to all these individuals that San Francisco General had a policy of being out of network with every private health insurance company. Um, once I wrote about it, um, and again, this is another example of kind of a story hiding in the open. You know, so when I called the hospital, they just said, yeah, we're out of network with every health insurance company. And I was like, well, I, I was like ready for this, like kind of like digging and like trying to figure it out. And they just, told me straight out that they were. Um, this had been happening for years, just no one had kind of pieced the pieces together. And it wasn't really possible until you started talking to a lot of people about their billing experiences. Um, once I reported this, it pretty quickly led to some policy change. Um, the hospital now is in network with insurers. There's legislation being worked on in the California legislature to outlaw that kind of billing behavior. 
Um, that all came from just talking to people about their experiences. Um, and I think it was a powerful reminder to me about how patients, you know, or in my case, as I cover healthcare, patients are often my best source in understanding how policy is working in the United States today. Um, another example is using people to understand policy. Um, so this is another this is another one of my stories I want to talk about a little bit. Um, this is a story I worked on in the wake of the um, Trump Trump's 2016 election. And one of these questions we were kind of talking about in our newsroom is that a large number of Obamacare enrollees had voted for Trump. And why would they support the president who very clearly wanted to take away their health insurance? So I started my reporting talking to a lot of experts in DC about, well, what do you think about this population? Why are they voting this way? And they kind of had a uniform answer for me. They said, well, you know, one of the things about Obamacare is not like labeled Obamacare, right? You don't get an Obamacare card. So we think these voters, you know, didn't fully understand that their coverage came through Obamacare. And if they understood, they might have voted differently. Um, so then I decided to go check it out for myself. So I went to an area of Kentucky that has some of the highest Obamacare enrollment in the country and also voted 90% for Trump. And what I found on the ground was all these experts were 100% wrong about what was going on. Um, the people I interviewed said, yeah, we understand our health insurance is part of Obamacare. We get that. We're just really frustrated with how the health insurance works for us. We have big deductibles. We have big premiums. We feel like we're being, this is at the point when the individual mandate was still in effect. We feel like we're required to buy a product, but we're still kind of scared to go to the doctor. So it was a very, very different story than what I was hearing from the people I talked to in DC who study this population and the population themselves. So I really understood the role of the Affordable Care Act in these communities a lot better after visiting them. And it was a totally different story than what I would have written had I just, you know, had I not talked to people, I probably would have written a story kind of about what I'd been hearing from these experts. So it really changes how you understand policy when you see how people are affected by it. Um, so when to bring people into your policy stories. So it's not, I still write some stories that are just straight policy. You know, a month or two ago, um, Mayor Bloomberg came out with his health care plan. I wrote a story about, you know, how, here's how his health care plan would work. I did not go out and find somebody who would be affected by the health care plan. So how do you make those decisions about when to be, bring people in or not? Um, I like to bring them in when they're clear individual level effects of a policy so that you know certain people, you know that there are certain people who have had their lives changed in some way. When a state has expanded Medicaid, for example, or decided not to expand Medicaid, like that's one I think of as a clear one where you want to hear from people what impact that's having on their lives. Um, one that is very relevant right now is how health policy works in the United States and coronavirus. You know, are people scared to go to the doctor because it's so expensive in the United States? That's a type of story, you know, that I'm starting to look into where I can think, okay, there are individuals who I know who are being affected by this. I know people have high deductibles in this country. I think this is a story where some patient voices can tell us something that I can't figure out without them. Um, Another one is when a person comes to you with an interesting story and you want to figure out why it's happening. So this is more starting with the person and then getting to the policy. So that story I shared earlier about the $629 Band-Aid, that story started when someone emailed me and said, I got charged $629 for a Band-Aid. And he said, do you understand what's happening? And I said, I don't, but I'm curious and I'm going to find out. And that kind of led me to call experts on emergency room billing and say, hey, I got this bill. Will you look at it? And um, you know, then I started learning like, oh, in emergency rooms are these things called facility fees, which is the price of walking in the door and seeking coverage. They're not public and they vary a lot hospital to hospital. So all of a sudden I was learning about, even though I'd been a healthcare reporter for 10 years, I was learning about this part of health policy that I didn't know about before. I didn't know about these facility fees. I didn't even know they existed. Um, it was actually, you know, so that was one case of someone tells you about something weird's happening in their life and you, instead of, I could have just written, you know, patient billed this much for a Band-Aid, but you can dig deeper and kind of find like, well, what is the policy story? What are the policies that led to that person being in that particular situation? Um, and the last one, this is more logistical, but um, you have a bit more time in your reporting process. Um, these things do take time. That Zuckerberg story I mentioned, I mean, that kind of unfolded over the course of months where I was seeing these things come into our reporting project. But it wasn't you know, for a number of months where I had enough of them and I had the right story to kind of lead my piece that I, want, that I went forward with it. Um, it obviously takes more time to reach out to people, to track them down. 
So you do need a little bit more time in your reporting process. Um, I'm just going to stop here. Are there any questions related to what I've talked about so far? Or, you know, I'm curious to hear from you all if there's examples you have of kind of bringing people into your stories that you feel like have been wins or kind of what's been valuable. Yeah. Um, when you do finally bring people in, how do you, when you do finally bring people in, how do you assess how many people to bring in and yeah. when do you cut off or how do you, like, do you have a general population in mind or do you yeah. kind of speak from three different groups of people with mm -hmm. the same problem? Yeah, so generally I'd like to, I mean, it depends a little bit on how unique the situation is. You know, with the case of the $629 Band-Aid, I knew I really just wanted to write about that particular person. Um, so in that case, it was more finding the experts who could explain what was going on in the bill. Um, if I'm trying to answer a more general question, like why did Obamacare and Rollies vote for Trump? In that case, I want to cast a pretty night wide net. And I think in that one, you know, I talked to more than a dozen Obamacare and Rollies on that reporting trip. Um, so I think, I mean, it's a little vague, but I think it's kind of like however many people it feels like it takes to have like a confident answer, you know, that you're getting your facts right. You know, with the $629 Band-Aid, I just needed one guy with this bill. And like, I, I had the billing documents. I knew I had my facts right. With something like, well, why did people make this voting decision? I wanted to have a wider net of people to make sure this wasn't just one person telling me something. Um, or in this case, you know, a story I've been thinking about lately, like how are deductibles in the United States going to affect coronavirus, that's probably something where I'd want like at least like a half dozen or so patients to talk to me so I could get a wider um, net of people versus kind of one person's opinion on that. Um, do we have a question back here or comment? I don't know yet. <laughs> uh, okay. My name is Dan Vach, uh, formerly of Governing Magazine, now a freelancer. Um, and uh, my question is, is sort of about when you get somebody in, mm -hmm. how you keep the narrative clean, because especially in healthcare, I found mm -hmm. you know if you write about somebody who has dialysis, they also yeah. have a heart problem, or right. you know they can't like it, it. just gets really complicated real quick. Right. So any tips that you have for like how to like, you know, not oversimplify, but also not sort of get that messy you know, situation. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And generally in medical billing, it often gets very complicated. Um, and there's so many things going on in the bill. There's the amount the insurer paid and, and often the insurer, the hospital and the patient all have different understandings of what actually happened. Um, so the first thing I would say is just talking to every player in the situation to make sure that I understand exactly what happened. Um, so one of the things I found very important in my reporting is I always have to get the billing. I, I wrote mostly about medical billing is I always need the billing documents. Sometimes patients will tell me, oh my gosh, you can't believe like what this hospital charged me. And then I look at the bill and it turns out, well, actually it wasn't quite that much. And you know, it turns out the insurer negotiated it down that things are often more complex than the individuals you're working with understand. So kind of making sure everyone has had a chance to weigh in. And that make, means you know, you're know you not gonna get any nasty surprises on the end that actually something was a bit different. Um, and then in terms of keeping it, uh, you know, the narrative neat, um, I generally only, even if I interview like a half dozen patients, I'm generally only gonna talk about one or two in the story that have the most compelling, clearest cut um, example. You know, w one of the reasons that Zuckerberg's story took me so long is I was getting a few patients where their stories were just like, a little too complicated for me to feel like, okay, this is going to land. So I made the decision, you know, either I'm going to wait and do this story when I have the right person who has kind of a cleaner narrative, or I'm just, you know, maybe at some point I'll write it, but I sometimes I decide to see if I can wait a little bit and if the right person's going to come al along for the story. Um, I think that ProPublica story I showed earlier, that was a really good example of them like, deciding, okay, we're gonna wait a little while till we have the exact right person and then land with more impact. Obviously that can be hard when your editor is you know, asking for things sooner, but if it's more enterprising stuff where you have a little more flexibility. Um, and then in terms of telling it, sometimes there's just details I have to leave out about you know, their lives or what happened that just aren't, I try and think like, is this fully relevant to understanding the situation or is this like a complication that I just don't need to get into in this story. Um, so, you know, often these medical billing things have a lot of complications that I just decide, okay, this was interesting to me and I understand it, but 
I don't think this is act. I think this is going to make it harder for the reader to understand. So it's good that I understand it as the reporter, but I don't think they actually need to have that information in there. Um, but I agree, it can be. And sometimes I will often chunk stories like this kind of between personal narrative and policy section. So I'll have like a personal narrative section to start, and then there'll be a subhead, and then there will be some kind of like policy explainer section, and then it'll go back to the patient. So that sometimes kind of helps blocking out, kind of and giving readers a sign of like where they are in the story. Oh, yeah. Hi, uh, my name is, is this on? Hi, my name is Abby Vasoulis. I'm with Time Magazine. Um, I just did a story on housing vouchers that required I find um, people who had Section 8 housing vouchers but then had a hard time uh, using them. Mm -hmm. And I was on a really tight deadline. I needed to find uh, people outside of D.C. and New York and San Francisco. Mm -hmm. um, and they had to have a compelling story. Mm -hmm. There were all these, like, uh, targets my yeah. editors wanted to hit. Um, so I reached out to, like, I don't know, like 15 housing nonprofits across the United States and was asking them if they knew anybody in these circumstances. And they all came back at different times. A lot of them ended up giving me great uh, people that I yeah. could connect with. But, you know, I had limited space because it was a print story. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm wondering what you do once you get too many people who may make the story and how you um, politely say, like, I'm so sorry, but yeah. I already found somebody. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, and I will say, I, I empathize with you, because I feel like I, I very remember, specifically remember, uh, my very first job was at Newsweek magazine, um, which is not done quite as well as time anymore. Um, and I got sent to rural Pennsylvania, and they said, okay, we want you to find a voter who, um, this was during the primaries of 2008, we want, you, we want you to find a voter who supports Hillary, but will vote for McCain, because um, they don't like Obama because they're racist. Like I was given like person that they wanted for this story. And that kind of, uh, those assignments just frustrate me because I feel like you're not actually going out there to like figure out what the story is. You're just going out there because like they've decided what the story is and like need a quote to, um, to fit into it. So um, I empathize with like reporting assignments where you've given, given like very specific parameters for what you need, um, I, I find them challenging to deal with. And I really, you know, when I when I try to go into stories, I, I want to go into ones where like I don't know what people are going to say. Like I don't know what someone with a high deductible is going to tell me about going to the hospital for coronavirus. Maybe they'll say, "Oh my gosh, I'm so freaked out." Like, yeah, I'm going to go. Or they're going to say, "Heck no, I'm not going to go. It's so expensive." Um, I think the best stories where you're bringing people in is where you don't actually know what's going on with the policy, and you want people to tell you. Um, in terms of you know when you get too many people, I mean one thing is asking editors for more space online. Um, it, it's something you know um, I haven't dealt with this as much because I've mostly been in digital the past number of years. But at least when I was at the Post, um, the Washington Post, right before before I was at Vox, they would often run things longer online because there's you know fewer space constraints. Um, and I think just being really honest with people um, that you know. You were on a deadline. You really appreciate them getting back to you, um, and keep keeping people in mind for future stories. You know, you kind of never know where your reporting is going to take you. Um, so they could, they might be a helpful source if you kind of keep covering the same beat. Um, okay. Well, why don't I run through my last few slides and we can talk a little bit more. Um, so the last few things I want to talk about are how to find people for your policy stories, because I always find this the most challenging part. And like I said earlier, I would love to hear if you guys have any tips of how you've done this. Um, so using social media is one of the most powerful things I've found. Um, people are really willing and interested to talk to reporters, um, more so than you know I generally expect. So this is just you know one tweet um, you know I posted a few months ago when I was looking not even for a particular story, but just saying, you know, I want to familiarize myself with what this experience is like, and I don't know, um, so can you tell me? And, you know, I got a lot of people who wanted to share with me their experiences with, like, maternity or NICU billing, who emailed me, who DM'd me on Twitter. Um, this is another one from one of my colleagues at the Times who's a parenting editor who was um, looking for people to, um, to talk to her about taking care of kids and elderly parents at the same time. Um, I think one of the things that can make these more successful is you, tagging other people who you know have bigger followings is a really nice way 
Um, sometimes other health reporters will tag me in their callouts, um, and I, I always retweet them because I have I, I want to see them all succeed and tell wonderful, interesting stories. Um, so I think it's perfectly appropriate if you know there's other reporters on your beat to you know tag them in their tweets or even like DM them and say, hey, would you mind retweeting this? Um, I think that's a really good way to kind of amplify your message. Um, the same thing with your newsroom. Um, you can ask you know, the people who run the main social accounts to share your things. Um, I'm often bothering like the main New York Times people. They're more picky about like what does and doesn't go on the New York Times um, Twitter, but they might post it on like New York Times Health Twitter or like some of the other accounts that we run. Um, and that's a really, I, I think this also just shows like you're a human. People can see a picture of you. They can kind of like think of you as a real person. Um, so I think this has been like a really nice way to bring in sources. Um, and also, oh, joining relevant Facebook groups. So I'm in a bunch of Facebook groups um, that are all about like medical bills and patient billing. I'm in one that's like mostly medical coders, um, where I'm just looking. I'm looking to see if they post interesting stories once or twice. Like I've had a medical coding question that I've posted in there. Um, so I have also, when I'm working on these stories, sometimes we'll post them in a Facebook group where I know people are kind of interested in this particular issue. Um, what else? Um, Use your stories to seek out more stories. So I think this is actually one of the best ways that I found people to write about is um, is asking people to share their stories at the end. So this this top one, this is from Publica. This isn't mine. They've been doing a lot of great work about hospitals or doctors suing patients for their medical debt. And one of the things you'll notice that they do in all of their stories is they always have a call out like this, saying, you know, we're interested in hearing from people. Um, if they've been sued, if they work in medical debt collection, and they have a, a questionnaire, which is not hard to make. I can talk a little bit more about that. But if you have access to Google Docs, you can very, very easily make a quick form that people can fill out to send you information. Or if that feels too complicated, um, you know, this bottom one is from, uh, this actually ran on the bottom of the $629 Band-Aid story. Um, we put in a call out that we later learned was much too vague. We just said, have you faced a medical bill like this? Tell us about it. Email your story to Sarah Cliff. Um, I got over a thousand emails. Um, we should have been much more specific in what like this meant um, because anyone who had a medical bill just felt like they wanted to um, send an email. Um, so it was a good cathartic process for a lot of people, but um, maybe not the most targeted call out. But I, I just want to say that because you don't have to have like a fancy questionnaire or anything. You could just literally put your email address at the bottom of the story and see what happens. I like this because it's such a low effort um, thing to do. You know, you don't just do much except just add at the bottom. Like, we want to hear from more people like this. And worst case scenario, it doesn't work out. Like, best case scenario, you get some really interesting stories. And I will say, when I was doing this emergency room project, um, I worked on it for about a year. And of the only times we would see spikes in submissions is when a story ran. And so each story brought in more and more people with stories. And each of the the greater, the growing size of the database meant that there were more interesting ones coming in. The first few stories I did in that series actually weren't that interesting. They didn't do super well. Um, but then the stories started getting interesting as I was getting more responses. So I'd say if you, if you are doing things like this, you know, try and put the call out as many places as you can, maybe on other stories that are on a similar topic, um, talk to your newsroom about whether they're comfortable with that kind of thing. Yeah, uh, just wait for the microphone. Hi, Hi I'm Timmy Broderick with the Christian Science Monitor. Um, on this sort of thing that you include at the end of the stories, mm -hmm. often you'll see it, like you say, like a end of ProPublica, end yeah. of like a big series. Do you think there's any value in having it on just like a regular story that like, you know, like, is impact is impactful mm -hmm. ha, has a big narrative you know however long it is but it's just a standalone do you think mm -hmm. it's still worth having something like that or is it kind of like eh, it's not really I think if you're open to doing a follow up mm -hmm. it's worth having it I mean cuz it just feels like um very low effort possible high reward um you know worst case scenario nobody sends anything and you kind of move on best case scenario like someone sends you a really interesting story that they wouldn't have thought to do otherwise. Um, so I generally err on the side of like, why not do it um, if you're open to the idea of writing about it. Um, and one thing I will say is actually we, when I was at Vox, we would have this at the bottom, but in my ER series, we tried to put it pretty high up too. Because unfortunately, as we know, most people are not going to make it to the bottom of the story. So one thing we started doing was just inserting a line of text, you know, 
maybe a, a few paragraphs in because we re in that case we really cared about getting people to respond. Um, so um, that's one way you might increase your responses is kind of moving things up. Uh, yeah. So one more question. Yeah, of course. Um, you've done a lot of this reaching out to like readers, seeing like, hey, like we want your mm -hmm. stories or whatever. Um, do you have any suggestions for? Uh, wrong ways to go about it because you've done it so yeah. much and like pitfalls to avoid if we uh -huh. also try and go down this road yeah um, okay wrong ways to do it I think one is not having like a not having a clear question that people can help you answer um, I think I went into you know this so this ER project it grew out of the six hundred and twenty nine dollar band-aid so I wrote that story in like mid 2016 and it's just one that like stuck in my mind that I thought about a lot. And I think at some point I was, I was talking to my husband. I was like, I think what you'd like really need to do is like collect bills from people. But like that sounds crazy. Um, and then I kept thinking about it, and I was like, pitched it to my newsroom, and um, the legal department was like a little like heart attacky when I was like, I would like to collect a bunch of personally identifying information. But luckily we worked through all of that. Um, but I think the thing that worked there is I had a very clear question. I wanted to know how much it get cost to get treated in an American neuroemergency room and what um, what consequences it had for people. And I knew the only people who could tell me that were patients. Um, so I think the ones, so so if you go in with like a too broad of a question, I think that can work against you. If you go in with a question only very few people know the answer to, that's also going to hurt you. I think this works really well when it's something lots of people are experiencing. Again, like the ProPublica series on maternal mortality, that unfortunately is becoming a more common experience in the United States. So there's a wide net of people you can cast. If you're looking for like insiders at a company, like that's gonna be the thing that doesn't really like lend itself as well to a call out. Um, and I think only posting the call out once or posting it like not in a prominent way I think one of the things we learned with our project is you really, um, if you want to get a lot of responses, getting like some kind of endorsement from your newsroom is pretty helpful. Sometimes that just means like finding your very friendly social media person and going to them directly and saying, "Hey, would you mind like re-sharing this if I if I post it?" Um, or you can go even bigger, like I did with this, and like you know build some kind of tool to collect patient stories. There's a big spectrum, um, but I'd say not having a specific enough question you know, going for something that very few people know the answer to and like not taking steps to make sure that the call out is seen. Those are the kind of things that are going to make these a little bit less powerful. Um, yeah. Um, I'm curious, have any of you guys experimented with this kind of call out stuff before? And I'm curious kind of what, no? Okay, well hopefully you do and hopefully it leads to great success in the future. <laughs> Okay, um, one other one. Okay, so connecting with advocacy groups that work on the issue you want to cover. So this is kind of what you were talking about with housing. Oh, sorry, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Oh, no problem. Um, just quick thought on if you can share some input on the experience of working with compliance on issues like that. So if I'm, yeah, my interest is in financial markets, okay. issues related to the retail finance market. Mm -hmm. So highly regulated and yeah. super private and mm -hmm. as with medical issues. Yeah, yeah, so basically when I came up with this idea, we kind of decided we wanted to do it, and then we brought in our legal counsel to ask them about, about okay, like what risks are we taking on? They ended up bringing in, because uh, you know media lawyers don't have an expertise in like health privacy law, so they ended up consulting with another um, lawyer who basically walked us through, you know, here's what you can do, here's what you can't do. Um, and then we had to have some discussions because you know, like nothing like this is completely risk free. Like we were going to decide to take on risks by holding some patient information, but we wanted to do it in the most secure way possible in the way with the smallest legal risk. So it was a negotiation between myself and our legal team about okay, what are we allowed to collect? How do we have to store it? With everyone having kind of the shared goal of like wanting this project to work, but also not put the company at like some kind of massive legal exposure. So I think it's finding someone with expertise, finding someone who like believes it's a worthwhile project. Um, and one of the things I really appreciated at Vox when I was working with our counsel is that it wasn't um, a discussion about how can we have zero risk at all, which is just really hard to do legally. It was how can we minimize our risks as much as possible to so where we feel comfortable um, taking on this project. I say the short answer is, is just looping them in early as it might affect um, you know, the scope of what you're working on and getting their guidance. Um, 
but also not necessarily taking no for an answer. You know, there were points when I pushed back and said, no, 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 for this project to work, like we really need to collect this kind of data. And like, how can we get to yes on that? So taking their advice, but also, you know, feeling um, free to like ask for the things you, you really need to like make this kind of stuff successful. Um, so this is one other one I've used is, you know, how to find people for your policy stories is connecting with advocacy groups. Um, and the great part is they often have sources available. In my space, there's a lot of patient advocacy groups for different communities, for cancer, for lymphoma, that often have patients who are dealing with some kind of medical issues and can provide people to speak with me when I want to understand, you know, what, what is the role of a deductible for a cancer patient? Um, the con, which is pretty obvious, is they, you know, often come at this with a particular agenda. So you have to be aware of the fact, you know, they have a dog in this fight. Um, and kind of just keep that in mind as you're interviewing patients. And you know, I shared this story, this is a story I wrote about um, a policy that an insurance company had instituted of denying emergency room visits that they deemed non-urgent after the fact. This is a woman who went into um, the emergency room in Kentucky. Um, she was having really bad abdominal pain on the right side. She says, but her nurse, her mom was a nurse, said, oh, it might be appendicitis, you should go in. Turns out it was um, fibroids on her um, uterus. The insurance company decided that was not actually emergency, so she owed $12,000 for her visit. Um, so this is a story I'd been wanting to write for a while, and I was looking for examples of the ER bills that were coming in to see, oh, is there anyone who's having their ER bill denied? Um, and I wasn't seeing them come in. Um, so I reached out to some of the groups um, that kind of work on behalf of hospitals and say, hey, are you seeing these kind of denials in your hospital, and this was a patient that they put me in touch with. Um, I still, you know, did my due diligence of interviewing her, collecting the billing documents, um, but this was one case where they just had a better network than I did, and were able to connect me with a patient that really pulled this story together. So, um, I'd say generally, I prefer finding people on my own. My first choice is, you know, using social media, um, using, you know, combing through people posting on Twitter, people posting on Facebook, which I say is another great use of um, social media, is searching for the terms that you're, look, searching for the terms that people might be using to post about the situation you're interested in, and um, often including the word I in your searches. Most of these are going to be first person, so um, like I sometimes end up searching like for phrases like, I have a huge medical bill, or like, I search for expensive medical bill every now and then on Twitter just to see if like something interesting is out there. I'll also search on Reddit and Facebook as well. So I generally prefer finding my own sources. I feel like it's just a little bit less complicated. But when I need to, I'm not adverse to working with some kind of third party group um, if they can help connect me with the right people. I just want to make sure that I'm doing like a lot of work to check things out and report things out on my own. Um, yeah. Okay. I think I'm almost at the end. So, um, great. Oh, and then we'll commence up the questions. Um, oh, and how to find people? Ask your ask for help from your newsroom or you know whatever situation you're working in. Um, and these can I feel like there's a real big spectrum of like you know how much help your newsroom can give you. Um, you can do some a super low lift is sharing your request on social media on Facebook, on Twitter. Um, I think on Facebook and Twitter, it's important to share on both because you're going to reach some different audiences on those. So I like to ask for it to be shared on both. Um, LinkedIn is another platform that has a lot of users, and I don't think it's utilized enough. So that's another place where you could ask them to share. Um, if you want to take it up another step, you can create a form where people can submit their own experiences. Um, I can talk a little bit more about how to do this, but it's very, very easy to do in, um, just with Google. You don't need any you know, fancy tools to do it. Um, and then include links in relevant stories. Um, so this can be a little harder. Um, you know, when I was at Vox, I was const I was writing most of our healthcare stories. So even when I was writing a story that wasn't about my emergency billing series, I would just insert our form in like all of them. It just kind of became rote habit. Um, I didn't talk to editors a lot about it. I just kind of put it in there, and like if they wanted to take it out, that was fine. But I kind of I made it was important to me, so I made it my priority to kind of stick it wherever I could. Um, so that's one, I don't know if that's the best ask for forgiveness tactic, but um, I don't think newsrooms should be adverse to you um, reaching out to people for reporting. Um, I think that is, yes, that is my last slide. So I think we have about 10 minutes left, so I'd love to hear any questions. And if there's experiences you guys have had with success, you know, bringing people into your policy stories, I'd love to hear about those as well.
Uh, good afternoon, Phyllis Gilchrist. I'm affiliated with uh, Georgetown University. Mm -hmm. The question I have for you is uh, how your own personal experience with um, health care and the health care industry has either informed or impacted mm -hmm. the approach you take to some of these stories. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I, I suffered a foot ankle injury myself. Oh, no. Something that feels like a couple of generations ago. <laughs> but to to yeah. this day, you know, there can still be concerns. Yeah. And, and certainly not to get too personal with you, but obviously right. you're having yes. an issue now that you're yes. dealing with. So how, how has that informed yeah. or perhaps shaped some of your perspective on what it is you yeah. cover? I mean, so I say one of the things I, one of the reasons I like covering healthcare is because it's something that affects everybody. Like none of us get to choose if we're part of the healthcare system. You know, we, we just are. Um, and that's one of the reasons, again, like I, I like writing about policy because it's so consequential and especially it's literally matters of life and death when you're writing about health policy. Um, I think my experience as a patient certainly informs how I approach it. You know, I wrote, and sometimes, I, especially when it comes to healthcare, um, things are just so weird and zany the way we do things that there's constant story ideas when I go to a doctor's office. Um, one of the stories I had a lot of fun with is um, I was having this crazy situation, related, also related to some foot issues, but not this one, of um, I was trying to get some records transferred somewhere, and everything was being done by fax, and it was like causing all these issues. And I was like, well, why the heck is like medicine running on fax machines? in 2020 and I said you know what like I'm a reporter like I'm going to write a story about this um, so I ended up and that was one that was kind of just inspired by my own experience and then I started interviewing doctors about like their experience with facts and my um my favorite experience um my favorite interview was this guy um who accidentally faxed some patient records to a secret NASA number <laughs> So then all of a sudden NASA called him being like, how did you get this number? And it turns out he had just like gotten like one digit wrong on the fax machine. Um, so that was one where, you know, just being a patient in our system and being a curious person kind of led me to a really interesting story about there actually are like very clear policy reasons why and policy decisions that were made in the Obama administration that are the reason why fax machines are still so prevalent in American medicine. So that was one where I took my own personal experience and created a policy story out of it. Um, I think one of the things that certainly taught me is how complicated billing is. Often patients like can't get it right the first time or they're like trying to explain their bill to me and it's not super clear to them. And I think I have a lot more empathy going into these like when people can't quite get it right, um, understanding why that is. And I think it's also why I'm so insistent on getting billing documents because I found, you know, there are situations where I don't really understand where something costs, and like I wouldn't unless I gathered up all my billing documents and, and saw what they said. So I think that's another thing. Um, and it just certainly made me like a lot more, you know, going through like breaking my foot a few weeks ago, it makes me a lot more empathetic to the stress of like having to deal with medical bills and the worry about medical bills when you're also dealing with some kind of like healthcare trauma that um, it's just like, it, it makes me, empathize more with the people who are going through all of this. It is. It is. Hi, um, I'm Sarah Patalski. I work as a communicator. And we talked earlier about emotions and, and mm -hmm. part of humanizing stories, I feel, are how do you get the readers to see mm -hmm. themselves in it? We talked a lot about that. I'm curious, you mentioned Ezra Klein. I think podcasters have some mm -hmm. really interesting um, you know, ways of doing this. When you're interviewing, are there questions that you find you you are returning to that yeah. have been really effective with with yeah. the stories you're trying to tell? Just curious if they're yeah, yeah, favorites. No, I, yeah, the question that like usually gets the quote that I end up using the story is like, how did you feel when you got the medical bill? Um, and that actually often is like the quotes I end up using are from that or were you surprised? Another one that ends up, um, I, I think this like relates to a lot of policy is you know, thinking back now, would you have done anything differently? Um, the ones, I don't like to quote people saying, my bill was really expensive. I want like the numbers to kind of speak for themselves on that front. I want people to tell me how it felt to get the medical bill. Was it something they were worried about when they were seeking, how did they feel when they were seeking treatment? Like, were they thinking about it or not? Looking back, was there anything you would have done differently? That's a question I ask a lot. Often in medicine, it's like, no, I feel like I'm stuck in a trapped in this like situation. But even that is kind of uh, helpful and like reflective of like the policy thing I'm trying to get at. 
So I think the questions that are most useful to me are ones that get people to think back on like how they were feeling at different parts of um, parts of this. Or even when I was reporting with like Obamacare and Rollies, um, who voted for Trump, you know, we got it. There were some like pretty emotional interviews when I think people were talking to me. It was one of the first times they realized, oh, like my health insurance like might be on the line. Because a lot of them, when I interviewed them, they were very frustrated with their insurance. They'd heard President Trump promise very good insurance. So they said, well, I think I'm going to vote for him because like he's going to make my insurance better. And then we had this convert. We'd had a number of conversations, you know, and a few. Some of these people ended up crying during that. Where it felt like for the first time they kind of got that, like, oh. Maybe I'd lose my health insurance, and that would be even worse. Um, but really, all those questions about like, how did you feel when this happened? How did you feel when that happened? I feel like those tend to yield um, the best responses. Yeah, my name is Cynthia Smith. I'm a member of a Fair Budget Coalition, so I have I'm with the issue housing issue group, mm -hmm. homelessness and um, <laughs> healthcare, mm -hmm. and community safety. Uh, my question is, uh, with all the um, uh, articles you reported. Uh, how do you handle backlash, and mm -hmm. can you give us some points on uh, moving forward? Yeah. How do you sure. Yeah, yeah. So uh, a few things. Um, one is I try to keep like everyone who I'm reporting on like informed about what I'll be writing. Um, I think like the worst case for a lot of people I write about, their worst case scenario is whoever they work for reads the story and is like, what the heck just happened? Like, I want them to know. When I was working on this story about Zuckerberg's San Francisco General, which is a very negative story about them, I made sure the hospital knew it was coming. Um, they had time to comment on it. They, you know, were, they knew that I was working on this story. And I think the spokesperson I knew, talked to, was aware that, like, it probably would not paint them in the most positive light. So I think one is just, if people are aware of what's coming, it helps them. Um, soften things a little bit. Um, I, I've been, you know, writing about healthcare for a decade at this point, so I'm constantly, like, working with the same people. So I have a lot of incentives to keep my relationship strong. And even if I am going to work on a story that's going to make someone else's day very, very hard, I want to give them a warning that the hard day is coming versus to have it be a surprise for them. Um, the other one is always being open to listen to criticism. Um, you know, I do get things wrong. I've had to publish corrections on my stories. And if something is wrong, like I want to get it, I 100% want to get it fixed as fast as possible because I have no interest in having wrong information out under my name. So being willing to listen to people, hear you know what they're frustrated with, and see if it warrants a correction. Um, and if not, just treat them with respect and say, you know, you know, I appreciate your feedback. I don't think we're going to do a correction on this. Um, and but I think just being honest and open with people, that's kind of the thing that helps um, with and having my facts in good order. Like when I write something, that's going to be a huge benefit is if there's really a lot of times people can be frustrated with the, frustrated with the story. But if there's no um, nothing there for them to challenge, it kind of just fades away. And I, I've had multiple times people, you know, yell at me and tell me We're, I'm never going to talk to you again. And they just don't follow through. So I will say, if you um, end up in a situation like that, know that you as a journalist are just as important to them. And that after a year or two goes by, like you probably will start getting phone calls from that person again. When you say that you let people know what's coming, mm -hmm. I mean, asking for a comment is a way mm -hmm. of letting people know what's coming. Are you really talking, though, about something in addition? What exactly does that mean? Yeah, so I think letting them know, you know, if if it's a story I'm writing about a hospital, saying like, you know, I'm planning on doing this story about a hospital. Here's like what I'm planning on reporting about your hospital in the case of Zuckerberg, that you're out of network with all private insurers. And here are like, I think in that case, and often particularly because I'm often dealing with matters of hospital billing, I'm often telling them like, here's the patient's name, here's the bill that they have. Um, I'm giving them the opportunity to comment on that bill. I'm offering to get the patient to sign a HIPAA release if they feel like that is necessary for the reporting. Um, I really want whoever is involved in the story to have the chance to comment on whatever it is that relates to them in the story. If it's not relevant to them, I'm probably, I'm, I'm certainly, and it is against New York Times policy, I'm not sending out drafts of my story to anybody. I'm certainly not going that far. But I am letting people know, like, here's how you're involved in the story, asking for comment. And like in the case of like, because I often write about these billing disputes, often letting them know the exact details of like the name of the person, the bill, 
And I always ask patients, you know, when I'm interviewing them, is it okay if I reach out to the hospital and ask about your bill before making those um, making those questions? Uh, I'm Brooks DeBose. I work uh, for the Capital Gazette in Annapolis. I cover the city. Um, I work a lot with like public housing, mm -hmm. covering public housing, and obviously I, I noticed that when you said that advocates in mm -hmm. the healthcare industry have uh, an agenda mm -hmm. similar in public housing. I was curious if you have any sort of tips on how to, uh, I want to use those people in the story because yeah. obviously they're experts in, right. in the situation, but also to sort of temper that with the agenda that they have in terms of representing those people. Right. I mean, I think the best way to do that is just being, um, you know, as informed as you can about the issue and seeking out a diversity of opinions, um, like finding the people who are going to disagree with those advocates or at odds with those advocates and making sure you're talking to them as well is kind of the best way to get the most complete picture. You know, like I've been writing about the surprise billing debate that's happening in Congress and there's just basically it's a debate where insurers and hospitals or insurers and emergency room doctors are just at total odds with each other. Um, and each of them want different kind of legislation and can tell you why this legislation is better than the other legislation. And so I feel like it's my job as a reporter to kind of, um, you know, understand what's in it for them um, and um, understand both sides of the policy debate. Because in most policy debates, if you're debating some kind of policy, there's usually going to be some people who support it and some people oppose it and doing the work. And even asking them, like, who are your main opponents in this? Um, you know, like asking them who they feel is on the other side might be one way to kind of look for more sources. All right. Well, thank you so much for being such a wonderful audience. I really appreciate it.